This episode, I'm joined by Raina Guldin to discuss the life and work of the philosopher Wilhelm Flusser. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paying patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support the podcast or just keep everything running, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Raina Guldin, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. We are going to be discussing the work of Wilhelm Flusser, who is an ex- well, was an extremely eclectic and expansive philosopher who perhaps we could define as a philosopher of communication, a philosopher of photography, a philosopher of nomadism and migration and what it means to move across borders and not stick to one place, but um, before we get into the work of Flusser, and I'm just so people know, I'm primarily taking my inspiration and influence for the questions in this discussion from a book, uh, Reiner, that you co edited in 2011 called Wilhelm Flusser An Introduction. Um, so before we get into the work of Flusser, just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, what it is you do and how you came across the work of Flusser. Well, I first came across his work in the mid 19 mid 90s. Uh, nearly 30 years ago, I was working on a photographer called uh, Hubert Fichte, and um, I uh, met his book uh, and read his book uh, towards the philosophy of photography, and they found it very inspiring. And then I put the work away for another four or five years, and I came back to him. And this time I was interested, above all, in the translation and the fact that he writes in four different languages and keeps translating and retranslating himself. I found that very inspiring. And so from there, everything ensued. I met Edith Flusser and I we found it um, Flusser Studies and I have been uh, reading and thinking and writing about him ever since. And I think he's still, for me, a, a source of inspiration. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 as I was reading just Bef- uh, in research for this discussion, I was reading about you, and I see that you wrote sort of your dissertation and then uh, other books on on figures in literature. So, did uh, this this notion of translation was this sort of a perhaps a personal problem that you you then found Flusser sort of helped with over time? Yeah, actually, when when I when I came across the idea that uh, writing is translating and his practice. I was quite fascinated because uh, it sort of um, corresponds to my own uh, existential situation. I speak different languages and I have also published in different languages. But actually, I wanted to work on Nabokov, and uh, he is also a writer very much into translation. And uh, my problem there was that I don't speak any Russian. So I came across Flusser, who even expanded the theme of translation. Uh, so <clears throat> I found the kind of um, right environment to develop my thinking. Uh, that's what was my entry into his world, the, the idea that uh, the central uh, subject uh, is always translation and the process of translation and everything that ensues from it. I mean, you have it in yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So before we get sort of... Um knee deep into the work of Flusser, I of course have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room uh, and listen in on the conversation. Flusser is already there, so who is going to be joining him in this room? I, I, first of all, Michel Serre, <laughs> even if the two have never met, and I think they don't know each other. I know that Flusser read uh, some stuff by uh, Serre in the 1980s, or perhaps even earlier, because he mentions him at a certain point in his uh, in his work. And then I, uh, so they could have the discussion they never had that would be interesting uh, to listen into what they have to say to each other. And then I thought of two more thinkers. I thought perhaps Heinz von Förster, von Förster, the uh, constructivist, the German Austrian constructivist. I think there is uh, a link between constructivism uh, the constructivism that he developed along with Ernst von Glasersfeld and Flusser, especially in the later work. And then I would put in some people uh, into the, in the field of multilingualism and translation, uh, like Mona Baker and Theo Hermans. That should be quite interesting having these three people conversing with him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this 
I see this as a room of ultimately of translation of people uh, struggling with that problem of articulation between so we say between borders or between nations or people or you know this idea of trying to get a message across when it has to be changed in some sense but they're exactly. not but they're not necessarily approaching it in sort of the sense of Wittgenstein it's not necessarily a problem distinctly of language in that sense would you would you agree with that well Wittgenstein was an extremely important influence uh, in the early uh um, work and life of uh, Wilhelm Flusser. But I think uh, Flusser moves beyond that. And uh, I think, uh, well, we, I, we can talk about the, the importance of language uh, in, in his philosophy perhaps later on, because this, this is a bit, it would be too much mm -hmm. at this point to expand on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, just to, just to jump back into that room, do you think Flusser would uh, sort of take the lead or do you think there's a, a, someone someone might necessarily stand out in that room? I think he would definitely take the lead uh, as he had a way of um, uh, staging his participation, being a great talker and uh, perhaps a kind of dominant talker. And I don't know if the others will have much uh, space and time to <laughs> contribute their questions, but I think he will definitely take the lead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, it will be interesting to see uh, how he answers questions from Forster and Serre and perhaps even. Theo Hermanns, uh, who is into um, translation theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you? What do you? What what questions do you think he might ask that he might be struggling Ooh. with in that room? Uh, you mean Serre or uh, Flusser? Ah, uh, Flusser. No, I think I think Flusser had a way of of talking, and uh, he expected his uh, the people taking part in a conversation to react to what he was saying. So I think he would take the lead and then react to their questions and to their criticism. I don't think he himself would uh, ask many questions. Then uh, I think he's more the kind of person who begins talking and then reacts to the reactions in that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, this sort of this does sort of bring us to his biography in a way. So do, would you think his biography, which is very much one of being an exile, of having to move, of having to react to the situation as it is, do you think this, you know, influenced how he approached philosophy? As you say in that room, you know, he would be a reactive, he would be reacting to what what's the response is. Do you think that his philosophy and his life sort of go hand in hand in that sense? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think uh, the relationship between life and writing in his work is extremely um, uh, tense and extremely narrow. It's because, I mean, if you think that uh, he uh, was drawn into exile in the late 1930s and that his family died in the Holocaust and then he moved to Brazil and there he started a first existence and he moved back to Europe, and all these <clears throat> disjunctions and all these separations and all these travels and migrations had an, uh, are directly to be found and uh, in his work, not only as far as the thematics, uh, the subjects is concerned, but also as, as a method of jumping back and forth, of moving, of, uh, of migrating across uh, themes, and of uh, revising constantly his his uh, his uh, his ideas, but I, I think for me the most important thing in his work uh, would be multiplicity or plurality. Mm -hmm. Then the idea of in betweenness, which you mentioned already, this, in the sense of interdisciplinarity and intersubjectivity, and the strong um, bias of un unsystematicity, something he has always stressed. Uh, systematic thinking is dangerous, which kind of links him to Nietzsche, but I mean, the in-betweenness and the multiplicity link him to the three, to the partners that uh, we said we put in the same room, especially uh, Michel Serre. Mm -hmm. So do you think there's both biographically and philosophically then, he, has a, he had a sort of suspicion perhaps of people who um, I'm not a big fan of this word, but were privileged enough to have that uh, have you know a stable systematic existence where they they had their nation, they had their home, they had their borders, and in a sense, to build a philosophy from that is not necessarily incorrect, but it's going to have this almost unseen bias. It's a bit suspicious. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, 
uh, all the main uh, ideas of his work they they are connected to each other and uh, they always stress uh, instability open endedness uh, work in progress uh, reconsidering what you have already written and thought this is at the very basis of thinking and if you think that he uh, starts out with the German text and then he moves on to when the, he translates the same text into English and then in French and then in Portuguese and then back again. I think this is the very center. So he uh, is profoundly suspicious of any idea of nationality, border, stability, objectivity. That's why I put the constructivists in, uh, in the room with him because he has this approach uh, of... Uh, Philosophy is creating uh, a world, is creating meaning. In German, you call that Sinngebung. You are not finding the sense out there, but you project it. So, yes, of course, you would be profoundly suspicious of any kind of strongly classifying thinking, of systematic thinking. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you think for him that the people who've sort of then are in, you know, a I guess blindly obeying a system, or they believe they've they've found you know the system, as many philosophers do. Would that for Flusa be a point where they've basically just stopped? They've stopped living. I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, it's the idea of doubt uh, because uh, doubting is something that has to be active all the time. Uh, in, in On Doubt, a text written in the 1960s, Flusser wrote, I doubt, therefore I am. Hmm. It's a parody of Descartes. So I doubt that I am, so I doubt that I doubt. Uh, because we can, we can start out with doubt and say that doubt is something you must keep alive, but you must also doubt the doubting process itself, because otherwise it becomes the only perspective you have. And here again, uh, there is a close uh, link to uh, Michel Serre with his idea that, uh, as Chris, I think Christopher Watkins wrote about the umbilical thinking, uh, where you have an, a center that defines everything around it. And I think Flusser would strongly um, uh, attack that uh, as an ideological, as a dangerous way of moving and interpreting the world. Mm -hmm. So would there be such a thing as a center for Flusa or are these sort of just these momentary things that if we hang to them, that's our own sort of our own fault, really our own uh, oversight? Well, if you look at the way he works, I mean, uh, he starts out with an idea and uh, this idea stays uh, in the center of his attention. When he translates, he starts out with an intuition and then he writes a first text and then he moves on to several other texts in other languages. But I mean, the subject is always the same. So it's it's not that Flusser says there is no center and no synthesis uh, because um, there are both elements. You have the center and the possibility of a first synthesis, which is never the final synthesis. Uh, but in between, you have also the jumps and uh, the movements that uh, open up uh, new perspectives. Um, in German, you would say Standpunkte. A uh, Standpunkt is a place where you stand and uh, you look at uh, the object, which is at the center. Mm -hmm. The center kind of gives the, is, is the, the, the thing that we are talking about. We are not moving out uh, in, a, in a completely free uh, uh, world where we jump from one idea to the other. So there is both the moving and the jumping and the migration and the translation, and there is something that ties us back, which is the subject. And Flusser has uh, uh, interpreted the work of the photographer in the same way. The photographer is moving around, circling around the subject that is sort of in the middle, and he takes pictures, and each picture has a value of its own. And I don't know if you know, he wrote a text in the 80s called Pilpul, which is a Jewish uh, theory of interpretation of, uh, of, the, of the Torah. It works the same way. You always have a center that, is, that needs our attention, but the center is only something we talk about. So I think we have both analysis and movement and synthesis. So in the sense that we only talk about it, we're, there's always some moment of sort of hesitation in the sense that 
it's a, an ongoing relationship between the center and the subject. Exactly. It's in, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it is not losing himself, you know, in interpretations. He is always going back to the initial idea, which of course is always different because he has gone through different phases of interpretation. But the basic idea is that which keeps our thought uh, anchored, if you want, to uh, it's something we, we move around. Mm -hmm. But also we change as we as we exactly. go through that process as well. So it's changing on both sides constantly. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So is there would there be any sense of teleology or, or you know direction or vector or goal for Flusa, or is it this not necessarily? I don't, I don't want to say it's the cliche of like the journey, but but what happens to sort of truth for Flusa? Is it always have to, has to be moving? Yes, of course it has always to be moving. Uh, truth is only something. Uh, it's 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 uh, something we create in, uh, in the interpretation. It's, uh, truth is uh, a way of looking at the world, which can be changed. And if we are in a group, uh, we can negotiate and renegotiate what we define as the truth. So the truth is something that can be achieved, but it's not something that we stay attached to. Mm. And if you allow me, I would say something about te teleology. Mm -hmm. This is what you... Mm -hmm. Well, there is a teleological movement, a very strong one in Flusser's work. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to write a book about religion in Flusser. And uh, there, if you have a look at all his work, it, there are always stages. And these stages move from an initial point to a final point. And some of them are uh, like staircases in... Uh, in the universe of uh, the universe of technical images, you have these five stages. You know, you move from four to zero. You move up on the scale, but and you jump from universe to universe. And you find that all in all his work, uh, basically, it's translation because you you jump from language to language, and then you can jump back. This perhaps is the moment where teleology turns into a circle. So it's not. Again, we don't have just a, a teleology which would lead us somewhere, but there is always the possibility to go back. Um, but I mean, like, uh, there are different, I can give you a few examples more where you have, uh, at a certain point, he talked about nomadism. Mm -hmm. And there he had, you have a three stage movement. You have nomadism, no, you have nomadism, then people settle, and then we go back to nomadism. The second nomadism, of course, is not the first one, but it's again a stage and a certain idea of uh, teleology, if you want, or linear development. Or if you take towards a philosophy of photography, there you have also three stages. You have the image, and then you have the text, and then you have the technical image, which is more than the image and other than the image. And I think this is something I'm trying to understand in which ways, because it's, it is a teleological and... Uh, it is religious, how he used this and how he transformed it and how he made use of it in in, in the different books he wrote uh, in, in the course of his life. In that sense, and that's sort of perhaps not cyclic, but it seems that there might be a possibility there of both a teleology and a, and a selection, like an evolution. You, you mentioned scale. Do you think there's a notion of it going, you know, upwards or, you know, quote unquote higher or... You know, selecting certain properties, or do you think that it's maybe more sporadic than that? No, but well, uh, he, he was well aware of the danger of a linear development or evolution. That, that's something he criticized uh, several times. Um, I think uh, the idea of the circle breaks it up. Uh, but there is more irony, like uh, in a universe of technical images, it's it's it's. Um, it's a countdown, you know, it goes from four to three uh, to two to one to zero. And ironically enough, this, the zero is the end of the evolution. It's emptiness, but at the same time, it's a new possibility. So he is playing with this linearity, uh, with the idea of moving up, which basically in, in the universe of technical images is a moving down. But he's always introducing elements to, to criticize uh, because he is well aware of the danger of a, a uniquely linear kind of uh, thinking. Mm. 
what would what would something be that's outside of this movement? Is it just something that's almost lost to itself? Well, there is a kind of automatism in it, and I, I don't really think uh, that there is a kind of automatism in the sense that uh, uh, these different stages they 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 are just happening. But uh, at the same time, there is a, a existential moment which explains why they are happening. But still, it is there is a kind of automatism that leads us from image to text to technical image. Um, Flusa calls it the dialectics of mediation. It's the idea that uh, in order to understand our world, we create a theory. But this theory, in, in a certain sense, uh, subjugates us and blinds us to other developments. So we have to step back. It's always the idea of stepping back, moving out, liberating yourself from your ideas by moving into another universe. So that, that's another way uh, in which this kind of automatism of, if you want, natural evolution of media and codes is uh, criticized and uh, is opened up to change. Mm -hmm. The peers, I mean, so Flusser, of course, has a, the, the Jewish background, but as I understand it, was, was he uh, agnostic? Was he atheist or did he, uh, you know, adhere to any religious practice? Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to find out in my book. I think he started out as uh, somebody who was, in a way, profoundly religious. Uh, when he moved away from uh, Prague, uh, he took only two books with him, and it was Goethe's Faust and the Jewish prayer book, which has been kept. I've seen it in an exposition, which is very telling. You know, Faust is also, in a way, a very... Uh, religious book because it's the pact with the devil which plays an enormous role in Flusser's work mm. so at a certain point uh, but Flusser had letters he exchanged with his cousin David Flusser who is a Jewish uh, writer who ended up in Jerusalem and Flusser has always been asking him about Jewishness about God about belief and I remember that at a certain point he wrote that his problem was that he couldn't pray anymore and uh, I think it has to do with the disappointment of, uh, I mean, the exile, the fact that his family was killed. I can only um, formulate hypotheses here. But I think there is, that's why I was so fascinated, because the strain is there, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to understand how this all this moves into his theory, because it keeps popping up. And especially in the theological dimension of the phases and of the stages, it, it seems to me to become apparent again. But I think in the end, Flusser gave up. He didn't believe in God anymore. But he switched. Uh, there is, a, for instance, telematics. Mm -hmm. Telematics is you bring the other person near to you. And Flusser calls this Nächstenliebe, which is Judeo-Christian. So it's the love for the other. And you recognize God in the face of the other. So I think it's not it's not secularizing, but again, you know, translation being the main principle, it's like he's translating his early religious belief, whatever you might call them, into these new forms. Yeah, I mean that that's the impression I was getting that there's a sort of with the idea of this uh, the, the the form of evolution that we've been talking about and especially this idea of uh, a type of scale of stages there appears to be basically the language of mysticism but it's been stripped of the classical language of mysticism and Flusser is um, attempting to translate it into something not necessarily modern but something which can adhere to to modern man oh yeah yeah I think you're Right on target there, because uh, in the letters to Alex Bloch written in the 1950s, and they exchanged letters until the 80s, there is one of the first letters he wrote him, he talks about Uspensky. Mm. And Uspensky clearly... I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, he even uh, comments Uspensky's structure, and there you have Four, three, no, I don't remember exactly now, but you have the same idea of a movement, you know, zero dimension, two dimensional, three dimensional, only that Uspensky, of course, interprets it in a very different way. And um, on my research for these traces uh, of religiosity, uh, I came across in the 
in the first book, in the 20. Jahrhundert, which has not been translated into English yet, if you go into the biography, you find people that like uh, are, were close to Blavatsky, you know, in the mm. late 19th century. So there is a streak there, you know, and it, it keeps coming back. And Flusser writes in the 60s that he was interested in Meister Eckhart, which is mm. a German mystic, and um, Johannes von Kreuz, another mystic. And he was in part also interested in Simon Weil, who was, mm. uh, she didn't really convert to Catholicism, but if you know Weil, Mm -hmm. She moved in that direction, and Flusser was struggling with that for quite some time, and I think in the end he gave it up. But it didn't go away. It just changed uh, form and entered in uh, his work and thinking in, in, in different ways. So, I mean, to sort of draw this together and then head over to language, I mean, I'll probably throw a lot at you here with this now, because... When I was reading this, I thought mm, the the connections with especially Uspensky. Uspensky was someone who kept coming through, and I thought, no, maybe I'm off the mark. So I'm glad you mentioned it. But with Eckhart and the notion of negative theology of removing everything and you know not piling it on, just remove, 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 and that's how you get closer to God. Very roughly, um, that connects seems to me to this notion of doubting. You keep doubting until you're at something, and it seems that the thing that Flusser perhaps gets to which he can't get beyond, so to speak, mm -hmm. is language. That's where, or, or, or how we're using language and how we're translating our experiences. And so it's just this constant act of translation. It's translation all the way down, but it's in mm -hmm. that act of translation that perhaps this mystical thing which Flusser is heading towards is, is hidden. Exactly, yeah. And you know, the notion of translation is not only a linguistic notion because uh, the stage is the he describes the stages as a form of translation. When you move from the, the image to the text, you translate images into text, and then you translate texts into techno images. So it's always there, you know. But the question was, what's the meaning of language? Or I, I didn't get well, the yeah, question. Well, yeah, I now. mean, is, is there anything beyond language? I mean, that seems to be the foundation for Flusa that we have to deal with, that we have to, that seems to be where doubt would constantly return to is how are we, you know, how are we using language? Well, I mean, there, the, the Flusser, I don't know if Flusser uh, knew about the linguistic term, but if you take his very first word, lingua e realidade, that, or the title already suggests it, lingua e realidade, language and reality. A reality is language, language is reality. And uh, if you read through the text, it, does, it looks very much like... Um, Language is the ultimate reality, and there is nothing behind it. There is the abyss of nothingness. And because uh, language is defined the way we look and experience, we look at reality and the way we experience the world. And Fusa went even so far as to say that each language creates its own separate, unique reality. And there is a quote, uh, it, uh, he says it reigns differently in different language universes. So it's mm -hmm. it sounds like a kind of, uh, linguistic determinism. Um, that this determinism is linked to the teleology we were talking about before, you know, mm -hmm. which is also there, and uh, it didn't go away because the determinism of l languages is reappears, resurfaces in the determinism of codes. You know, mm -hmm. um, we live in an, uh, in a, a period where technical images dictate the way we live and look at the world. And there is a moment of determinism, if you understand what I mean. But mm -hmm. as we said before, the same way there is a central point we keep returning to, which stabilizes the system and everything else, yeah, I know, exploding, moving on. The same way it seems we could say there is a kind of hidden determinism, which is always questioned, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, by the notion of freedom, by translation. But uh, th I don't think for Flusser there is anything beyond languages or beyond codes. Mm -hmm. He would deny, I mean, perhaps he's Kantian in that sense, a very radical Kantian, but I don't think Flusser would accept the notion of an objective reality in, in the classical sense. Mm -hmm. He would say that what we have is this... Uh, the way we look at the world. That's why I put him close to the constructivists. There are texts where Flusser says the way our brain works is the way we see the world. 
Mm-hmm. I think he was he was aware of the determinism, but he always opened it up uh, through another principle, like dialectics. You know, like uh, there is this stabilizing moment, there is this certainty, but it's always uh, exploded, implodes, and it's always disrupted by another principle that goes against it. And I think much of his philosophy is this um, tension between. Uh, the hidden stability or determinism and, the, and and an attempt to move against it. It's like the notion of entropy, you know? That's mm-hmm. another important moment. Entropy is, you know, I don't have, I don't think I have to explain it here. For Flusser, entropy is the, the teleology, but on a, on a natural level, because uh, the, the universe will end in entropy. And what the human being... Uh, human beings have to do is to move into negentropy, which is the negation of entropy by creating new information, by changing, by uh, not accepting this. And this is what happens at zero. Exactly, yeah. Huh. But the, the zero is a, a very fascinating moment because the zero is is is, is everything and nothing. It's not just nothing. Uh, it's like, I've, it's the same with uh, Michel Sale, you know, the Pierrot uh, is completely white. It looks like there is nothing there, but uh, the Pierrot is everything uh, in the sense also of uh, possibility. Uh, it's not just uh, uh, absence, it's presence, very strong presence. I think it's because Fusse thinks uh, very much uh, dialectically, you know? He has always two concepts that fight against each other. Uh, but I think this is a quite an interesting way of dealing with both openness and closure. Mm. So zero, zero in this sense reminds me actually of says um, troubadour, troubadour of knowledge with the the patchwork coat. If you've read the troubadour of knowledge by Michel Serre, where the yes, 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 keeps yes, yes, from, yes yeah. keeps removing his coat until eventually gets down to the skin, and that itself is a mottled patchwork. And this is this, uh, the, I guess, in in turn, this is ultimately that that task of you know it's doubting all the way down and you you don't get beyond that there is also another aspect linked to theology here because the people is this attempt to understand the word of god or even the name of god and f- for centuries r- rabbis and uh, that tradition has tried to go against it and explain it and the Torah, um, there is the Babylonic Talmud, which is a page where you have basically the uh, the word or the, the, the verse at the center. And even, and, and it's typographically, you have, you, there is a page and you have this center again. And then you have all the comments that move around it. And they are placed on the page next to each other. And these comments were written in different languages, not just in one. And the comments comment each other. And Flusse says the, the different comments fight against each other. Uh, but at the end, says Flusse, and, and you think this is perhaps a very strong moment that is often forgotten when you talk about Flusse, it's the moment of absurdity and the moment of death. Because everything we do, says Flusse, uh, leads into final entropy. All our efforts, will be destroyed. Human race will disappear. The earth will disappear. Nothing remains. And uh, the same for life. Uh, uh, after uh, you fight and you try to understand the world, but eventually you die. And uh, also with Pilpul, because uh, Flusser uh, says the, the Jewish interpretation keeps going against uh, the border of understanding, it keeps trying to um, understand what the word of God means, but it is doomed to failure. And but again, things change. There, the fact that uh, we will never understand the meaning of God or the word of God, it is this very non-understanding that keeps us going. You know, that keeps us uh, trying to understand. So that's also the reason why there are so many comments and comments upon comments and comments upon comments and comments because uh, or if you want translation and another translation and another translation and another translation but ultimately uh, you don't get there in a sense that you have the truth or you have objective reality you have just another interpretation uh, Flusser, for instance 
uh, he, he when he I had the impression that he had he had written enough about one single subject, he retranslated the text back into the first language. Mm-hmm. And uh, in, in, in an attempt to create a synthesis all of, the, of all the different positions. But in, in some texts, he says, well, that's not the end of it. We can always retranslate again. Um, admitting also that there is no final possibility of understanding exactly or of, of achieving a final truth. I mean, this is quite strange. I can't remember who the musician musician was, but there was a musician who would play his track, record it as it's playing, and then record that recording over and over and over again. And what you ended up with at the end was just complete static and noise. It was basically the, <laughs> the entropy of the music itself, right? So I wonder if that's in this act of retranslation, retranslation. I mean, perhaps you get down to almost some sort of strange, um, you know, uh, language or something that, that almost something maybe like akin to Finnegan's Wake or something like that. But... Um, uh, I guess well, one question to, to, to appear from this is whether or not you think then from Fluce's understanding, whether or not it's possible for a philosopher to really be a philosopher if they're monolingual, if they only know one language. Ah, uh, that's a very good question. Well, I don't know what he would have said. Uh, I think, yes, he would have said being monolingual is not enough uh, because you, you need the other position, you need the other standpoint if you want to move towards uh, an interpretation of the world to something we call truth. But uh, I think, yeah, he doesn't criticize other philosophers, but he criticizes strongly nationalist uh, ways uh, of looking at the world as a, as a dangerous limitation. And he says, that, well, for him, it's normal as being a Jew is also uh, being someone um, who lives in different languages. But he's not explicitly saying or criticizing any writers or philosophers, but it's an, it's, it's an assumption. Mm-hmm. If you want to be a good philosopher, you have to speak several languages, which is a problem because Sarah is such a good philosopher that he's only writing in French. But then you might open it up and say, well, even if you write only in one language, it's you're not truly writing in one language because if you take uh, Serre, he he opens up the richness of French because he has this technical language, you know, he, the language of the sailors and the language of um, like the baker or even languages used in so-called non-academic domains of life. So language is always multiple. Mm. But I, I, I myself would say the more languages you speak, and Flusser said so, the more lives you have. He says, uh, for every language, you have a different kind of life. So, yeah, he would say, well, it's not really enough Mm -hmm. to speak only one language. But that's also dangerous because I think it's, as I said, uh, everybody is in a way multilingual, even if he speaks only in one national language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I mean... Just jumping forward, I guess, a little bit. I mean, he's often, Flusser is often placed, I mean, if you do a quick Google search for Wilhelm Flusser, he is commonly placed within sort of media and cultural studies. And from our conversation, that seems to be a fairly incorrect place to put him. Yes, exactly. And um, I was thinking about that because, I mean, Flusser studies now, we founded it in 2005 and it's already quite some time, 18 years. And and, and one of the uh, things we wanted to do at the moment was not to focus only on uh, media theory because at, uh, 20 years ago, it looked already, and I think it got worse in the last years, that Flusser is the digital thinker. Flusser is a communicologist, and that's all there is to him. But I'd like the last number we published in, in Flusser studies in November is about Flusser and education. But there are many more Flusses, Flusses and I think that it, Flusser is a media theorist, but basically, no, he's a cold uh, theorist. But that's only one aspect. And if you, uh, we have been saying all along here that Flusser is for plurality and multiplicity. So there are multiple Flussers, you know, and the media discourse. Uh, reduces enormously the richness. And and what I have been seeing in the last few years, it it gets stronger and stronger. And 
I don't see any possibility to open up the field. You see, I'm writing a book on religion also to as a sort of um, as a challenge to this idea, because like as you say that uh, for, for perhaps all his media theory is is a kind of hidden the, uh, theology, mm-hmm. which many people I don't think would like. <laughs> but I think basically, I think basically, but Flusser I think wouldn't have a problem with that. He would admit it, no. But I think Flusser, when Flusser was discovered in the 80s in Germany, basically, with the photography book, he became very famous in a very short time. And you have to remember that Flusser what had been fighting for decades to be published and was not published. There was very little was published in the early 1970s. Uh, all, all of it has been published afterwards, because that's something one tends uh, to forget and in the 80s, he became extremely famous, extremely quickly. And he was all in the newspapers. And then he died, you know, which I think in a way helped the development because uh, Flusa, just before he died, he was writing a book about gesture and becoming human. He was not uh, interested in media anymore. He was going somewhere else. But perhaps Flusa, he had lived, he would have gone against interpretation. But I think... Uh, the, you know, the internet in the 90s, it made a big difference. And everybody in, in Germany was called the Digitale Denker, uh, a nice alliteration, which is true, but it's not the whole truth. It's only a small part of the truth. And one thing, I, we wrote, Gustavo Bernardo and I, we wrote a biography about Flusser, is that Flusser, when they went to him and he was invited all over the place, he was traveling by car through Europe. He was uh, here and there, and then he, he had talks and, and things were moving. That in a kind, uh, in a, in a sort, he was very flattered. You see, mm-hmm. he was extremely flattered and happy that finally in Germany you call that Durchbruch, where you you you, you pierce and you become famous. And I think he he pushed it. You know what you know what I mean. He knew that it was not everything, but he was riding, uh, he was surfing on the wave. And all of this has caused a kind of reduction of the field right now. But I mean, uh, it's kind of, it's destiny, you know, uh, uh, it had to happen. Mm. So I, I think it's, 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 you, you're right. I mean, it's, it's wrong to reduce him, but it's difficult now to move out of this, uh, a cul de sac, because I have the impression that most people dealing with him now are moving in that direction. That's the problem with reception. Once reception has established kind of canonical reading of a writer or philosopher, it sticks there. It happens to everybody. I mean, it happens to Benjamin. It happened to other writers as well. Uh, how how can they avoid this? I mean, think of self. I, I have the impression Sarah is not that closed in uh, not that there is not that of a limited reading closer yes unfortunately yes mm. but I mean, this is i just took a note here to say that i mean this sort of as you say this reception once uh, a philosopher is received in a certain way and if they make it into the so-called canon it is as a certain exactly. thinker um this sort of seems to be the entropy which flusser is talking about because once you have that sort of system around a philosopher well uh, as as probably we both know, it's almost impossible for them to become anything else. And anything which doesn't fit into that system is usually just cast aside as either ignored, or it you might get it. You might be lucky to get a very small monograph, a um, hundred pages or so on it. But it's it's sort of you know uh, detritus. You're right, and that, that's very, very ironical in view of uh, his idea of absurdity. You know, now he finally becomes famous, but perhaps. This fame has to be paid for by a reductionist reading of his work. But I think Flusser, perhaps he might have laughed about it, you know, <laughs> being the being life absurd as it is. That, that, uh, but I, th- I think uh, that there is always a possibility that at a certain moment, perhaps a new kind of negentropy enters the system and that uh, creates a spin off. But uh, at the moment, I don't uh, see any any other development that uh, an opening of the field it's more like as you said you know it's entropy and uh, uh, texts and uh, people who work in another direction are not really 
piercing are not really taken seriously. Are, are not quoted, for instance. You see, and then if they are not quoted, uh, <laughs> the system reproduces itself. End of translation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is the end. A very sad idea, I should think. You know. Yeah, and I mean it's once again another connection between Flusser and Sayre, where Sayre talks of the uh, the Marx Freud superhighway of the fifties, <laughs> the fifties and sixties, right? That no one could no one could really get off this, and then really what that meant was that Sayre, Girard, and a whole host of other thinkers got completely ignored. Um, but there is there is one thing I just wanted to bring in, at, you know, Flusser as this um, media in media and cultural studies and it, it really stood out to me because I'm I'm glad someone you know this this McLuhan message of the media the medium is the message is is sort of like become a mainstay of uh critical like media critical culture and Flusser very very strictly says the medium is not the message um and I yeah I mean what what did he mean by that well there is a misunderstanding here that and I think Flusser uses terminology uh, in an unsystematic way. And that has created also a lot of problems because basically uh, Flusser has not written a uh, media theory, even if he keeps talking about media evolution and media development. Uh, for Flusser, the, the, the central uh, notion is code. Mm. And codes uh, are not media because uh, if you think of media, you think of... Uh, Photography, or you think of computers and stuff like that. Uh, whereas uh, codes uh, focus on um, the creation uh, and uh, of information. Hmm. Flusser had uh, another besides codes. I mean, the three basic codes he has. Um, well, in a way, there are a few more in that appeared uh, in in uh, in the late 80s, but then he didn't develop it. He also added numbers, which is another code for digital images. And at a certain point, even colors, which is also a code linked to numbers. But besides codes, he had what he called Kommunikationsstrukturen. And there again, the important thing is how information is produced and distributed. And uh, that's something he, he wrote in the early 70s, uh, uh, Umbruch der menschlichen uh, Beziehungen. I don't remember the title exactly. Um, and there he has, a, again, a, a dialectical pair. He has dialogue and discourse. And dialogue produces new information and discourse uh, take, uh, uh, puts it like in a, in a, in a in a library, keeps it and uh, distributes it. And then he developed for each uh, of these different communication structures. Just an example, for, for the dialogue, he, uh, he was talking about the circle. So it, it's not media, because the circle is people sitting around the table and discussing to find out new things and to define plans and projects. And on the other side, the communication structure that is discursive is, for instance, the pyramid. The pyramid, of course, is also a a political statement because we have a top and in, in these communication structures the only thing that is important is how communication is transformed or distributed in the pyramid it's it's an army where the general gives an order and it moves down to the uh, soldiers uh, and, and you see that in in, in this sense uh, the medium is the message is is, is too easy a thing I, I i wrote i had here and if you give me a, a sec Okay, no, I can't find it now. Perhaps I, I can add it at the end. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one one thing, just this focus on codes over sort of media. I mean, that's that's a far more expansive way of obviously of looking at the world, of theorizing about the world. And this sort of brings me to a fairly stark, um, not necessarily a conclusion, but but a, a perspective, which is that the world from this idea that you have all these. Uh, deterministic languages and within as we were talking about say you know within french there is the language of the sailor the language of might even be the language of the rat or whatever um in in a sense from this it seems flusa does say that the world becomes quite fictive it becomes a fiction because you yes. you begin a you you sort of your world is a collage of whatever languages you you maybe even desire to identify with yes exactly yeah yeah Mm -hmm. um, fiction is an important uh, uh, 
notion in Fuss's work. He keeps uh, coming back to fiction. He even created a, uh, a text, uh, uh, a form of writing texts, which he called Philosophie Fiction. Uh, uh, the Vampiroteotis, uh, I guess you know the Vampiroteotis, is a fiction. It's a, a, a fable. It's a way of uh, talking about the world in fictional terms. The, the notion of fiction also implies that uh, ev everything is fiction. Science is fiction, and not science fiction, but science is fiction. Art is fiction. Literature is fiction. So in, in a positive sense, fiction is the creation of a new world. Uh, Zingebel. And uh, there is a, a, also a, 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 a negative side of fictions. Fictions can become ideological. Fictions are ideological uh, when they have only one point of view. For Flusser, ideology is the, having only one point of view uh, you stick to. Uh, but fiction uh, has many aspects. Now, nations are fictions, the languages are fictions, but the point is with fiction, again, fiction, if everything is fiction, you lose the meaning of fiction. So I, I, I this is not discussing this openly. Mm. He's only proposing fiction as a way of looking at the world. But if you have fiction, you need a, a kind of what reality is. You need a second term. It's like when you have metaphors, you cannot say everything is metaphorical because you need something that goes against the idea of metaphoricity, and like you have the literal, which doesn't mean that the literal exists, but you have to posit a second position. Which I think uh, as we have been going along, it keeps coming back, you know, these dialectics between opening and closing, with stability and centrality and, 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 and the opposite. So uh, there is a very early text in the 1970s uh, where Flusse introduces a notion that I find fundamental, and, and it's uh, it's he says we actually know what's true. No, he actually know what is right and what is wrong. So fiction needs, and this is another element, a moment of uh, ethical uh, decision, uh, of uh, not morals but ethics. Uh, we have to decide. Like we were discussing early uh, uh, the Holocaust. You know, the Holocaust is in a way a fiction. But it's not. It's very but because fiction is is okay if you use it for you know, I don't know for literature or films, but in some respects, fiction becomes very dangerous mm -hmm. uh, because if you say that the Holocaust is a fiction, you are making something, you're doing or saying something which is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. But in a certain sense, the Holocaust is a fiction. It's a story we tell each other about how the Jews were murdered uh, in the Second World. But uh, you see, fiction has a moment of truth. And Flusser knows about that, but at the same, how can he preserve the openness of fiction, the fact that fiction is a creation, something construed, a fable, a story we tell each other, and at the same time protect uh, what the fable is about? I mean, uh, and, and, and I think he, the good solution is introducing an ethical point of view and saying, we know what's right, we know what's wrong. We know what's true. We know what's false. Even if we, even if we're just discussing this, but keeping up the, the, the possibilities of deciding. Otherwise, fiction eats itself up because uh, if you say everything is fiction, then fiction itself is fiction, or the notion is. So it, it's it's the uroboros, which is also something Rousseau often uses. Mm. You are abolishing the term. So. I have the impression that Flusser introduces always a second term, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes openly, sometimes surreptitiously, because he doesn't say there is truth opposed to fiction, which would be wrong, you know. But fictions have a moment of truth. Now, even in film, they say based on a true story, which is in a, in a way it's ironical because it's in a film. But still, it, it the, the, the fact that the Holocaust happened, you know, that people were killed, you have to protect that truth because, as you know, many people deny that nowadays, saying it's just made up. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you have to say, yes, of course, it's a fiction because fictions are the story we tell each other mm -hmm. to interpret the world in a sense that we can always discuss the, the validity of our stories. We can always negotiate that between us and then find a solution. But the ethical is there. 
Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. No, no, no. It just it was a it's a clear moment, I guess, to draw in, just to draw in one of one of the you know the major figures that I know was an uh, an, an influence for Flusa, which is Edmund Husserl. And it seems that when we're talking about this, um, you know. <laughs> Whether or not there is a truth, there is a truth. Something happened, you know. There is these things that have happened in the world, but as soon as we, <laughs> as soon as we approach them and then translate them back in that Ouroboros, as you mentioned, that's when it, you know, the fictions become fictions, and they can become probably either dangerous fictions or they can retain that sort of phenomenological truth which we apprehended. But as soon as we, as soon as it enters into this multitude of language, uh, you know, it, it sort of. It's uh, uh, the prey for a lot of different things, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, one term, I mean, one term that is very important, as I said, is death. You know, Fluster says we create stories and we talk to each other and we create fictions to forget that we die. <laughs> but we know we are going to die. We're just uh, uh, talking, you know, he says that. But I think the other ma very strong moment is, is freedom, which for Flusser is... Uh, perhaps the most central um, concept in his philosophy, freedom. And you have freedom on many levels. Freedom Translation is freedom because you're free to translate. But Frusse says freedom is uh, not uh, wanting, uh, uh, being able to do everything you want, which is a very modern kind of uh, definition of freedom. Freedom is always a choice. You are free to choose, but you have to choose. You have to mm -hmm. pick something. And I think uh, that's fundamental. You know, you, you, you choose your partner, you choose to do whatever you are going to do. But it's something, that, that, like what I wanted to say, there are a lot of concepts hidden away in his work that, are not, uh, that have not been really dealt with uh, in, in reception, like death. There is not much on that. Uh, or, or, or freedom uh, or absurdity, you know, the absurdity of human life. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's no, okay. So, the you know, it, it, such an open and expansive and doubting philosophy, you know, it's, it might be a little bit difficult to pinpoint, well, what is what is uh, sort of the individual to do? And it seems that the individual then is to strive towards this freedom, this just constant choice of, uh, you know, towards bringing in some sort of newness to, to developing something. But it's also existential because... Uh... And that you have another pair of dialectical. You have engagement and dégagement. You you choose to do something, but then you realize it's it, your freedom is limited, and you move out of it. You know, but it has to do with uh, nomadism, with migration, with translation. You write a text in a certain language, and you realize you're not getting where you want. So this uh, engagement has to be stopped, and you move to another language. Which so it's dégagement from German engagement in the next language and that, that's freedom basically uh, this uh, choosing and then moving back even in the media evolution uh, theory you have the same thing because Flusse says we invented the pictures to picture as the world in German there is a beautiful uh, play of words he says uh, die Welt vorstellen to make for us uh, the world recognizable vorstellbar but then the pictures, sie verstellen, they close out the world in the form of idolatry. And you get to that point where you have to move back, dégagement, you step back, and you, that's the moment of freedom. And you define something new, which uh, gives you new possibilities in the media theory, it's writing. But then again, writing becomes textolatry, so you have to move out. So it's an endless process in a way. So is there anything you'd like to... Uh add about Flusser's work that you feel we've we've overlooked? I feel we've touched on the, the, the a lot of the key elements, but is there anything critical you feel we've overlooked? Perhaps essay? Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, in a way, when you when you get to know Flusser closer, uh, closer, closer, you realize that everything, all these structures, this way of thinking and of uh, putting things together, uh, they are always the same. Because essay, again, is uh, life is an essay. Uh, it's an attempt, it's an, an engagement leading to dégagement and new engagement. Perhaps that's something we might also uh, introduce. Um, you write, you live in an essayistic form because you want to write essays. And uh, 
writing and life. In Flusser, writing is life and life is writing. Um, I think he has a quotation somewhere, vivere necesse non est, scribere necesse est. Mm -hmm. So it's necessary to, it's not necessary to live, it's necessary to write because writing is living. Mm -hmm. I have found the, the, the quote, two quotes, if, if I can mm -hmm. just, the first quote is the one about death and it goes like this, human communication is an artifice whose intention is to make us forget the brutal meaninglessness of a life condemned to death. So life ends up in entropy and death. And another quote I wanted to, which I found, which I think sums up in a way what we have been doing here, and I'm using from my new book. It's from a text, uh, mid-60s. Flusser writes there, my life, was a, my life was a life without religion, in search of religion. Isn't that a definition of philosophy? At least a kind of philosophy? Nice. <laughs> yeah, both very nice quotes. And it, it's reminiscent. I mean, this talk of death and this sort of um, back to language and back to, I guess, these different kinds of structures that are formed and written by certain languages. It reminds me of probably one of the most famous books on death ever written, The Denial of Death and the idea that uh, for Becker, Ernest Becker, that all the structures of life are merely, we, we've created them just to to gloss over, to veil the fact we are going to die. And, exactly. But Flusser doesn't seem pessimistic. No, 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 no. I think Flusser had a, a, a side which you call in France bon vivant. Mm -hmm. Flusser liked to eat and to drink and uh, to enjoy life. And uh, I, in the biography, I came across uh, very often uh, the idea that Flusser was really he liked to have a good glass of wine. So he was uh, enjoying life in a, not in a sybaritic kind of way, but he was enjoying the pleasures of life. I don't think, I mean, it's, it's astonishing. He lost everything uh, uh, in the Holocaust. His father, his sister, his mother, his uh, grandfather and grandmother, they were all killed in, in, in the concentration camps. And he was 19 and he moved into a completely new world. I mean, Brazil in the 1940s was not the Brazil we have today. And, and I, I, he must have had an enormous uh, <clears throat> wish to survive and to, to, to experience life because that was what fascinated me most. How, where did he get the energy <clears throat> to move beyond, to move, all, uh, to move on, you know, after everything that happened and to end up being the person that he was in the 1990s, the digital thinker. I mean, it's, it's really surprising. So I think he enjoyed life very much. So That's good. Where do you think he got the energy from? I don't think that's a, that, uh, this is a very <laughs> difficult question. I don't really know. No. I don't know. I think he, uh, the, uh, one thing I, I, I remember in the biography, he wrote to a friend because the, the, the other person was saying, but I mean, the Germans are destroying our culture. And he said, I don't, I don't give a damn. The, as long as I can think and write and read, the Nazis can do whatever they please. I will be happy to do what I'm doing. Like the, the pleasure of life is basically writing, reading, conversing. And uh, I think that's what, that's what actually saved him, you know, the fact that he was he had to work in an office uh, in the early years, but he always read at night and he's, he never, he never abandoned that. It's, I think it's the thinking that saved him basically mm -hmm. the, the constant thinking and rethinking. I think I have seen videos where there is, you see, there is such a pleasure he has when he describes how he got to an idea. Wonderful. You see that his, uh, his eyes are glimmering. Mm -hmm. It's the pleasure of thinking of putting things together of writing uh, the, the intellectual adventure, if you want. I think that basically saved him. Mm -hmm. Where would you, uh, other than, of course, the 2011 <coughs> book, Wilhelm Flusser, an introduction, uh, where would you advise people to begin with Flusser's work? Well, it's difficult. I, I would suggest two books. I would suggest uh, Gestures, which is a wonderful book. Just gesture of writing, the gesture of smoking, the gesture of of shaving, there are some extraordinary, li there are little 
chapters of four, four to five pages. Um, and as usual, Flusser doesn't have any academic intentions. He He's writing an essay, something between the hybrid form. So you have a small text where he describes uh, everyday gestures. That would be very nice. That's a, a very beautiful book. And and then the other book I love, perhaps my favorite, is Vampiro Teutis. If you indulge his fiction, it's a wonderful book. Mm-hmm. It's it's this um, this animal living at the bottom of the ocean, uh, which is the, the alter ego of human beings. You know, it's a, it's a it's a squid, a vampiro teutic squid, and there are some reflections, incredible reflections, and it's it's a pleasure, an intellectual and. Flusser's texts are always not just an intellectual, but also a, an, an artistic and aesthetic pleasure, because he writes a very lean uh, language. I mean, I'm talking of German now. Uh, he has a language which is not uh, stilted, not academic. I think um, it's very easy to get to it. His thinking sometimes is difficult to follow because he jumps from one thing to the other. But if you, if you accept that, uh, it's really always an adventure to read his texts. Hmm. Okay, okay. And you're now working on a book on Flusser and sort of mysticism and theology. And I mean, I assume this is going to be in German? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> okay, okay. It is, yeah, I guess so. Um, when, well, when, you never know. I, will, know. <laughs> I, will, I, will, I can always translate it as he did, uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think at this moment, no. Mm-hmm. So whereabouts can we find uh, Flusser studies? Uh, please, can you answer? Uh, uh, ask again. Uh, uh, whereabouts can we find uh, Flusser studies? The it's the well, it, it, they're, they're, it's uh, studies dot net. Uh, I mean, you just I think when you Google Flusser, mm-hmm. sometimes it's already on the first page. Sometimes you have to look for the second or the next page. But uh, Flusser studies, I mean, we have it's. In the last 18 years, a lot of stuff has accumulated there. It's quite a lot, so like two, three, four hundred authors and uh, hundreds of texts. If you think we have 10 texts and we are, we have just published number 34. So we have perhaps about 300 and more texts. Mm-hmm. And there is a search uh, function there where you can search for content and the, the, the engine will lead you to the keywords not the text themselves unfortunately but to the keywords and to the titles mm-hmm. and then uh, in the archive we put all the links to the different earlier issues and uh, specifying the content because some of the some of the issues are have a special uh, subject you know there is an issue about Merano where he lived in the 70s or and we also have uh, special language issues. We have a Brazilian issues. We have a Polish issue, a Czech issue, because the, we publish in many languages. We publish in, in the languages Flusser wrote, uh, French, German, English, Portuguese. But we also have a uh, published in Italian. There is a special Italian issue. There is a special Czech issue. So we publish in Czech uh, and uh, also in Polish. So it's uh, many people can ac- uh, have access to that, even if they're uh, they don't understand German or French and the uh, English. Okay. Most of it is in English. There is always a, an abstract explaining the text uh, in English, and there is introductions are in English, and uh, quite a lot of texts are in English. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll be sure to put the links for Flusser studies and to uh, Willem Flusser and introduction in the description below. Um, Mm -hmm. but Reina Guldin, it's been a great conversation and, um, thank you very much. Thank you for having me invited. Thank you. It was a pleasure.